Court Member for Maitland. Thank you, Madam Speaker. A woman, let's call her Amanda, came to see me in my electorate office a couple of months ago. Amanda was articulate, well-groomed, clever and engaging. Like many people in our community, she married, uh, she grew up, got married and started raising two children. The marriage broke down, both parties went their separate ways. Amanda met another man and this time she was a bit more circumspect. She didn't want to rush into a second marriage. She'd had two small children. She wanted to just wait and see. During this time, Amanda became pregnant with her new partner's child and then things started to unravel for her. Her new partner started to abuse her to the extent that at times she was hospitalised. She was left the relationship. She was a brave and strong woman and she was able to do that. Amanda applied for an ABO from the courts and was granted one for two years. However, her ex-partner has continued to abuse her during this time. In fact, he has even written letters to her from jail in breach of these orders. At the same time Amanda was battling her ex-partner, applying for successive ABOs in the courts, her ex-husband was fighting for her sole care of her two oldest children on the basis that she could not keep them safe from her ex-partner. However, Amanda could not get her children to be listed on the ABO. Amanda has had to get three AVOs against her ex-partner, as although the courts have the power to grant a 10-year AVO, they won't do it in this case. On what basis do they think that this man will change his behaviour? He has not been through a program for perpetrators or any counselling. He has been to jail and yet continued his violence against her. What does she have to do to protect her children? What does she have to do to prove this man's continuing violence against her? Eventually, Amanda's two eldest children were removed from her care by the family court because they found that she could not effectively protect them against the violence of her ex-partner, because the courts would not protect her and her children effectively by listing her children on the ABO and not adequately enforcing the ABO to ensure her or her children's safety. Now her ex-partner is seeking unsupervised access to her youngest child, the child he has never lived with. Having been through so much, her finances have been drained and she does not have the resources to pay a solicitor and so she's representing herself. It remains to be seen how effectively she will be able to do this and it remains to be seen how clearly the court listens to her plight this time. Now you might wonder, Madam Speaker, if I've got the wrong bill here. Am I talking about domestic violence or am I talking about non-profit bodies and freedom to advocate bill? That is the bill I'm speaking about. Because this story goes to the exact heart of what this bill is about. If, as the Minister says, these bodies were free to advocate for their clients, then Amanda would not be in this situation. She doesn't want a political campaign. She doesn't want to score political points. She wants a real solution that grants her unfettered access to her children, protection from her ex-partner, and a real solution. She wants access to justice and fairness. And the gag that this government is placing on women like her and the services that are there to protect and advocate for her is leaving her in this situation because they are denying the opportunity, the government is denying the opportunity for her story to be told by policy makers. We as policy makers are usually far removed from the many, many cases of domestic violence in our community. We only see the most desperate of cases and then only those within our own electorates. We don't see the range of issues that non-government workers in refuges and domestic violence services are grappling with every day of their working lives. We don't see the complexity and, we, and the struggle that is their reality. In some areas of lawmaking, it is a good thing not to be involved in the minutiae. We can be more objective and we can look at the strategic vision of the government of the day and make policy which is designed to achieve outcomes for all in our community and not be caught by sectional interests. However, when we come to the very complex area of human services, we need to be able to guarantee that the most vulnerable people in our community are not left behind. Just because someone's case is unusual doesn't mean that it is any less desperate or worthy of our assistance. And it's sometimes, um, in these complex cases, these seemingly wicked problems that we, find, um, that we see in our community are where we need a solution that we can only gain from an unfettered um, ability of not-for-profit bodies to advocate on behalf of their clients. 
I undertook tertiary studies in psychology and counselling, and I want to share with you one of the definitions that was articulated to me by one of my lecturers, and that is that social workers take a damaged person, heal them, and then try to heal the society that damaged them in the first place. Our non-government sector is currently taking on more and more work in healing people in our community, and then again in healing our community itself. They are working on massive caseloads that increase every year and often, un uh, uh, often exponentially due to unfunded changes in government programs. They are the ones who are there at the coalface, the ones who see the people like Amanda who have to try and help them navigate the maze of legislation which acts against them at every time and then try and keep them safe and in some cases even try to keep them alive. When someone like Amanda is so badly failed by our justice system, when someone like her loses her children, faces repeated and seemingly unfettered violence from her ex-partner, when someone like her becomes impoverished fighting the system that is supposed to protect her, something is seriously wrong. To be the caseworker on this case would be soul destroying. The only light in the tunnel would be to see that there is an opportunity to stop this happening to others. Indeed, Amanda herself only came to me so that she could seek some changes to the treatment for other survivors of domestic violence. She told me she feels it is too late for her. But with the current service agreements in many of our refuges and other NGO services for the most vulnerable in our community, there are gag clauses there that stop these agencies advocating for their clients and for everyone in our community so that we can see the issues in our legislation and how it impacts detrimentally on people in our community, the very people we have been elected to govern and protect. These clauses are the equivalent of the government closing its ears to the community sector. They are funding them begrudgingly, but essentially saying, look, here, have the cash, now go away, don't spend it all at once, and for God's sake, don't bother us about this problem anymore, we've done our bit. This bill predicts, prohibits content in agreements which restricts or prevents a non-profit body, including staff of that non-profit body, from commenting on, advocating support for or opposing change to any matter established by law, policy or practice of the state. Why would we ignore the experience, wisdom, clarity and expertise of our non-profit bodies in helping to progress public debate when any other member of the community can become an expert on a topic just by opening a Facebook or a Twitter account? Why would a government want to ignore the advice of those who are entrusted with a very special task of dealing with these issues? We are proud in this nation of our democracy. When we ignore compassionate experts who help our most vulnerable, then we punish, when we punish individuals and organisations for speaking out against bad policy and when we write into agreements clauses which stop us from hearing where our policies fail, we chip away at the very foundations of that democracy. This bill asks us all to act with courage and conviction and integrity to ensure that we listen to those who, who we charge to look after the most vulnerable in our community. Please, I urge the government, open your hearts and most of all, open your ears to the most compassionate workers in our community and support this bill. Thank you.